individualization of uh, therapy. Uh, Professor Claude Negrier is the head of the uh, hematology department at Edouard Herriot University Hospital in Lyon, France, which is a Centre Regional de Traitement de l'Hémophilie, pardon my French. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Negrier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to talk about individualization of therapy. I would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to see Belfast under a sunny sky today. Um, <coughs> as an introduction, I will refer during this presentation mainly on the profit axis, just because profit axis uh, is not only the standard of care in most of the European countries, but also individualization has been carried out as an exercise, as an objective for some time in the field of uh, prevention of bleeds. Uh, on demand treatment has been much uh, less understood so far and much less looked at in terms of individualization of the proper dose to achieve hemostasis. Uh, having said that, there is a huge variability in terms of uh, phenotypic bleeding pattern among people with uh, hemophilia and the individual response to replacement therapy uh, is not completely well established, at least to my eyes. And uh, how to decide the initiation of prophylaxis and the intensity of prophylaxis uh, remain a matter of debate, but I uh, do believe that in the future, very near future, uh, individualization will represent one of the major goals uh, in the management of hemophilia, not only to uh, get the most in medical achievement that you can, uh, but for an agreed uh, cost for the society. <clears throat> and in this regard, these um, one-type molecules, uh, the one we are using uh, today, in, your, in Europe at least, uh, have some limitation, and you do know, of course, this limitation. And one of the questions that uh, comes immediately is that the longer acting concentrates that Paul just uh, presented uh, may have or may represent new options for tailoring prophylaxis. So there are some challenging situations. Number one is adherence issue. I will show you some evidence that adherence is not always uh, um, something that should be ignored. It's a major issue in adolescence, for example. Uh, the question of breakthrough bleeding during prophylaxis is also something of uh, uh, extremely high interest. The subclinical bleeding issue as well. And as I said, there is a viable phenotypic expression in terms of bleeding tendency for people having exactly the same level of the clotting activity for factor eight or for factor nine. And it's also very much dependent upon the patient lifestyle and the activity levels. You know the objective of prophylaxis. The objectives are quite uh, simple, to reduce the number of bleeding episodes that would prevent or delay arthropathy, and then we should protect the uh, joints uh, from uh, deterioration, we should prevent life and leave threatening bleeds, and uh, in order to do so, we would just convert a patient with less than 1% to a patient between one and five or even higher uh, units per deciliter. And presumably that will improve the quality of life. There is uh, some data clearly demonstrating that. Uh, the trough level that just Paul alluded to is, uh, is a question that is not solved to my eyes and I will give you some um, ideas about that. So let's start with uh, something which is relatively easy to understand. Do you think that all the patients need exactly the same dose at the same frequency? The answer is not, obviously. Presumably this young guy or <coughs> this person or even that person do not need a very high trough level in order to prevent bleeds. But think about this young gentleman here or the, the, the youngers who are playing soccer. They probably need much higher level. So in terms of just normal life, evolution of age, you can easily understand that not one size fits all. Some patients would need more at some age than others in terms of, uh, um, in terms of trough factor eight or factor nine uh, level in their plasma in order to prevent the bleeds. In addition to that, we have to think about coagulation. As we 
believe that regulation is working nowadays, we are talking about one single clotting factor which is missing in people with hemophilia, factor 8, factor 9. And that, this is a definition for the severity of the disease, severe, moderate, and mild. But we completely ignore in this definition what the other clotting factors and some cells, like the platelet, some white cells, the endothelial cells, are playing in terms of role for producing hemostasis. And in control non-hemophilic individuals, there is some difference between different individuals with regard to the capacity to build fibrin clots. And this is a three to four fold difference. So it's not trivial at all. We are not all the same, of course. And that's also true for people with hemophilia. It uh, has been said uh, in some relatively large population that five to 10 percent of the patients with less than one percent, in fact, do not have a bleeding tendency like their peers, 90 to 95 percent. They are bleeding less. Why? Several hypotheses have been proposed to the community and probably they are more or less uh, true because they are reflecting to the fact that not a single clotting factor is essential for uh, providing homeostasis, but this single clotting factor, eight or nine, is working in the middle of others, probably a, more than a dozen pro and anticoagulant molecules at the surface of specific cells which are called platelets or uh, monocytes. So there is a, clearly a balance in the coagulation factors and this balance is uh, taken as an advantage for phase one clinical trial that Paul didn't uh, so because it's not uh, public, uh, in the public domain so far, that uh, are aiming to rebalance the coagulation system by promoting, if you wish, the thrombosis side. And we'll see whether it's going to be successful or not. In addition to that, the lifestyle again and the musculoskeletal capacity, the structure of the joint, the structure of the muscles is not the same in every single patient. Uh, <coughs> exactly like for the inflammatory response and angiogenesis into the joint, which is likely to be different in different subjects. But having said that, this is what was the basis of prophylaxis and still is in many places around the world. We have been educated by our Swedish colleagues that promoted this prophylaxis treatment more than 40 years ago, that starting from zero, following an infusion, then you have a half-life of 10 to 18 hours, depending on the clotting factors, and the, the, the activity is going down again and shouldn't be below 1%. So the 1% trough level has been very uh, hardly promoted, with very good clinical da data, by the way, by our uh, uh, colleagues in Sweden, uh, in the Netherlands as well, and it's more or less a standard of care. So considering the half-life of the wild type molecule, the one that uh, patients are using nowadays, <coughs> generally speaking, two or three infusions are needed in order to keep this trough level above 1%. But this idea of having a trough above 1% do not fit, uh, at least in my eyes, to the fact that people, uh, depending on their age or their activity or their lifestyle, may need different levels, and you are completely ignoring the rest of the coagulation system. Having said that, there are advantages of prophylaxis which have been very clearly demonstrated. There is decreased bleeding tendency, there is no doubt about that. And joint are protected, that's true. Participation on social activities, sport activities <coughs> is much higher. Normalization of family and social life as well. Minimization of school and job absences. All these things are true. And there is a little price to pay to pay for the society, when, where, at least in societies where the uh, cost of the product is covered, and the cost of prophylaxis, just talking about number of units in patients per year is two to three times higher. On the long term, could be different because we could think that maybe less joint problems and less surgeries could balance these higher costs uh, at the beginning. There is a risk of non-compliance, and I will talk told you that I will be coming back to that 
And for those countries or those places who think that podcasts or a medical devices that give you proper access to, um, <clears throat> to the uh, vascular uh, space are needed, there, there are podcasts complications. Infection, thrombosis, so it's not trivial at all. With regard to adherence, if you look at this slide, which is very much representing what I'm seeing in my center on every day, people below the age of 12 have a, an excellent compliance. So pediatricians are happy people. More than 90% of their patients are really doing what they uh, advocate to do. And this is due to the high compliance of the parents. But when those very compliant children are becoming adolescents or young adults, the compliance level is decreasing and only 50% or even less here are really compliant with the uh, therapeutic recommendation that the physicians are giving to them. So there is a suboptimal adherence that could contribute to some decrease in terms of effectiveness of prophylaxis and maybe those patients who are not perfectly adherent with the current clotting factor concentrates could become more adherent with less frequent infusion because the uh, <coughs> obstacle number one with regard to adherence is the fact that uh, the clotting factor concentrates are delivered by IV route. If we were talking about uh, uh, pills, I think the adherence, including in teenagers, uh, would be much uh, higher. Number two, this is a kind of cinema um, picture which has nothing to see with the Titanic stuff. It's just an illustration, but I know that you will be visiting the Titanic this, uh, this evening, but it's just to give you an idea of what we uh, understood for a few years. Number one, th there are some symptomatic bleeds, the one that are uh, painful, the one that are increasing the size of the joints, and we don't know exactly how how much uh, uh, of this iceberg they do represent, but there is also some asymptomatic leads. It has been very well demonstrated in uh, large clinical randomized trials that even if the subjects, young children, who are reported absolutely no bleeds, clinically evident for them, or for their parents at least, there is some modification of the joint structure. And it, this is why we don't know whether it's 80 to 20, don't look at the numbers, but there is an incomplete protection with regard to the potential joint damage with the current prophylactic treatment, the one we are using. It's much better than on-demand treatment, but it is not perfect either. So can we individualize the prophylactic treatment in order to improve uh, the uh, different points are just uh, uh, listed here that are not perfect. You may find three approaches. Just a clinical approach, because the clinical bleeding pattern is not the same, and you can base your dosing schedule on observed bleeding pattern and the clinical response to the treatment. Very easy, relatively easy to do. There is also a pharmacokinetic approach, because if you believe that there is some relationship between the level of the clotting factor in the circulation of the patient and their likelihood to have a bleed, then pharmacokinetic makes sense, some sense. The problem is that not all the people have exactly the same pharmacokinetic characteristics, so you have to individualize that and take into account the individual uh, data for a single product, and I will come back to that later. Or you can use some surrogate markers of hemostasis and uh, factor 8 and factor 9 are not completely useful because you are measuring peak pharmacokinetic decrease and the trough, but as I told you, it's not a perfect illustration or representation of the uh, bleeding profile. So starting with the most self-evident one, which is a clinical approach. Pros and cons. The uh, clinical approach is relatively simple because you just see the patient, you talk with him, and you adjust the treatment. But if you want to do that in a proper way, you have to see the patient on the, re on the regular intervals, which is mainly true for uh, young uh, children and uh, uh, sometimes adolescents, but becomes a bit more tricky when the adolescents are a little bit uh, 
not so young, again, and the young adults. And then you have two choices uh, to initiate prophylaxis. Just step by step, you progressively increase the uh, prophylactic regimen uh, in order to uh, adjust uh, the uh, uh, frequency of uh, the administration in order to avoid the breakthrough bleeds. Or you can start full dose, two or three times per week, but in this case you are facing the problem of the venous abscess, which is not a trivial one at all. And then you adjust progressively either the dose in terms of unit per kilogram or the uh, intervals between the infusions in order to uh, prevent the bleeds. Uh, if you do that properly, you may have, at the end of the day, uh, a relatively reasonable number of breakthrough bleeds per trimester or per year, which is supposed to be less than four. And if you do that, you are doing a proper job, but there are some cons. The clinical bleeding pattern could be extremely different in patients and some may not have the same need than others. The number of bleeds which are really sufficient to cause John damage is not known so far. And the concept of one size fits all, as I told you, is probably uh, not a good cost utility concept. If you look at the pharmacologic properties of the uh, factor eight here, and look at the uh, probability to, to have a bleed per year, you, you, the probability is higher when the time below 1% is uh, <coughs> higher. So the higher the time below 1%, the higher the probability of having bleed. And in, in, inversely, the uh, higher the time below 1%, the probability of not having a bleed is decreasing. And this probability is a bit better for children than for adults, probably mainly because of the compliance issue. But are we sure that uh, the 1% trough level is the uh, adequate level? Um, yeah, that's, for, that's true for some patients with uh, uh, 1% trough level, they are not um, talking about uh, any bleeds where you, you, you are seeing them, but some patients, and some patients have normal joints despite the fact that they have clotting activity below 1%. It has been demonstrated in various studies between 1 and 10% of our patient population, despite the fact that they do have less than 1%, have relatively pretty normal joints. But for others, factors level above 1% are needed to avoid uh, breakthrough bleeds. And above 1% is very vague. It has been suggested by Albert a long time ago that in fact a threshold of 3% should be uh, uh, obtained. But I can tell you that 3% of course is better than 1. But it doesn't tell, it doesn't tell me uh, what at the individual level a single patient is really uh, needing in terms of protective level of factor rate to prevent a bleed or to treat a bleed. And I do believe that there are some patients who would need 1%, other 2, 3, others who need 5, 7, 10, and maybe 15. And to give you a very practical example of that, we have captured the information on the total knee replacement that we have uh, carried out in the last 20 years at my institution. And I was shocked, very much surprised, to see that about uh, almost 20% of the knee and hip prosthesis have been done in patients with more than 1%. So demonstrating uh, very clearly that uh, this uh, threshold of 1% is probably not the way to go. And it's not the way to go also in terms of pharmacokinetic for these very simple exercises. If you take two, two pe people, one with a short half-life factor rate, which is uh, linked more or less to the <coughs> level of Van Wilburn factor, as Paul John Brandes said, and one with a long half-life here, if, if, if this is true picture, which is not a computerized illustration. This is absolutely true. And you give them exactly the same dose of 30 units per kilogram, standard dose of profit access. And you look, at the clotting activity two days later, 48 hours. 
for the uh, person with a short life flag, the trough level will be indeed in the range of 1%. And, <coughs> uh, but in the person with a long half life characteristic, the trough level will be a bit above 10%. And maybe 10% is too high for this gentleman, and maybe 1% is too low for the other gentleman. So <clears throat> again, the personalization of prophylaxis with regard to pharmacokinetic is going to play a major role in, in the very near future. But the problem is that prophylaxis uh, and uh, pharmacokinetics has been uh, uh, regarded so far as a multiple sample exercise. You start before with the first sample, blood sample taken before the infusion, you infuse the product and then you measure the clotting activity at different sample times. And this, the number of sample times is between six and 10, to keep it simple. It's not very convenient, particularly for young children, as you can imagine. So using a Bayesian approach that was invented more, one, more than a century ago by Thomas Weiss, by the way, if you take only two blood samples as specific time points, you can have a very, very precise estimation of the pharmacokinetic characteristics of a single individual. So <clears throat> this is likely to play a major role, and if you have in hand with the computer these characteristics, then you can tailor the dose of the prophylactic regimen, either the intervals, three times a week, two times uh, every other day, or daily administration, and you can adjust the peak and the trough exactly where you want, depending on all the characteristics of the patients. And in this regard, I do believe that the long-lasting concentrates are clearly an advantage in order to uh, tailor uh, the treatment, just give more opportunity to personalize the treatment with less injections that would probably uh, um, uh, go with better adherence, easier initiation with once a week administration, and keeping in mind exactly the same objectives of avoiding uh, breakthrough bleeds and, if possible, subclinical bleeds. But to know that, we'll have to carry out uh, um, some <coughs> clinical outcome evaluation um, on the long term. And this is just an example of what just Paul mentioned to you. The extension of the half life is very clear for the factor 9, is much less uh, uh, clear, at least nowadays, for the factor 8. But you can also uh, use population pharmacokinetic in order to predict where uh, your pa the patients will be uh, uh, a few days, a few days, sometimes 14 days, uh, following the administration of the clotting factor concentration. So uh, I would like to uh, complete uh, this presentation by suggesting you something which is not completely demonstrated, at least for prophylaxis so far, but just to give you an idea. What is clearly missing in hemophilia is one single clotting factor, factor rate of factor 9. And as a result of that, the initiation of the coagulation system is absolutely normal in people with hemophilia. If you have a little cut at the tip of your finger, you have make a compression and the bleed stops because the initiation is normal. But if you have a larger injury, the propagation of the coagulation, which is absolutely needed to achieve hemostasis, is not properly occurring. So if we can capture by some way the capacity of measuring thrombin, which is at the very end of the coagulation system, or fibrin, which is one step down of thrombin formation, maybe we could have a more global view on the coagulation system of a single individual. As I, as I told you, in a control population, I don't like to, 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 to use the term normal, but in control population, if you take 100 individuals, measure the capacity to produce thrombin or fibrin, I can tell you there is a four-fold difference. And I do not see any reason why there wouldn't be any difference in patients with hemophilia. So we have looked at this thrombin, we and others have looked at the thrombin uh, generation capacity. And of course, there is a, a direct correlation with the level of the clotting activity. The one who, are, who, who have a severe hemophilia, here the curve, are producing much less thrombin than the one with moderate 
which are, who are producing more, less thrombin than the mild category, but none of these categories is like the uh, normal category. But having said that, if you take some pharmacokinetic exercise of different people who receive exactly the same dose, 50 units per kilogram, for a kind of pharmacokinetic exercise. After a few hours, you measure their factor rate in their plasma. And for those four individuals, you find exactly the same level, 18%. But with 18%, those two here are producing much more thrombin than those two here uh, at the bottom. Again, demonstrating that for the same level, the correction in their capacity to produce thrombin is not the same. This is true also without any administration of factor rate for people with mild hemophilia. <coughs> this exercise has been carried out in several families, and this family, despite the fact that people in belonging to the family do have factor rate counting activity between 10 and 20 percent, you would say they will not be bleeding, and you would be wrong. They were and are bleeding, and they are producing very little thrombin. And those uh, members of another family with exactly the same clotting activity between 10 and 20 are not bleeding at all and they are producing much more thrombin, demonstrating that there could be some relationship between the capacity to produce thrombin and the bleeding tendency. And this is also true for the fever patients category. The one is red in red here, a uh, patient with less than 1% is hardly producing any thrombin and the one is yellow, is clearly a gentleman like a mild hemophilia patient, and is one of my patients, he is not bleeding at all. So can you conceptualize the thrombin generation and apply the thrombin generation in the field of prophylaxis? I cannot tell you for sure, but there is some uh, ongoing exercise, and uh, if it works, I think it will, to some extent, revolutionize the way we are thinking about prophylaxis. Here is an example of three different young children. All of them are prophylaxis using three in, uh, infusions per week, and the dose are listed here, very close. So we measured thrombin generation following an infusion at different sampling points with the idea that the trough thrombin generation just before the next infusion here will be a reflection of their um, protection level, if you wish. And in fact, it's false, because <clears throat> those three individuals are not describing any bleeding event, and their trough thrombin production is not in the range of the severe hemophilia category, but in the range of the moderate, with the concept that you have, we have converted the patient from severe to a moderate hemophilia category. But this fourth one, with exactly the same dose, exactly the same intervals, has breakthrough bleeds and is a trough thrombin generation capacity is after 48 hours in the range of the sever and it has no protection at that time. This is also true for the people with inhibitors. I just took this example because I think it just exemplifies to me uh, the idea. <coughs> you uh, may have looked in the literature and found that one bypassing agent, which is called fiber, has a capacity when it is infused at the dose of 85 units per kilogram every or three times per week, has the capacity to reduce the bleeding tendency by 62%. In this population of people that participated in this exercise, if you take the one who have benefited the most from the prophylaxis with fiber, meaning that they reduce the bleeding episodes by more than 50%. You see here, you have the, bleeding, the number of bleeding episodes on the y-axis. And <coughs> here, the on-demand treatment, when they were using on-demand treatment with fiber, and when they use prophylaxis with fiber. Six, one dot is one patient. Six patients here did not experience a single bleed when they were using prophylaxis with fiber. So the idea at that point was to try to understand why those six individuals were not bleeding at all. And again, if you look at their th at thrombin generation, this is the same individual with, you have two options if you think about prophylaxis with bypassing agent, either 7A or fiber. This gentleman, for some reasons, I will not enter into the details, is not 
properly producing thrombin with uh, recombinant 7 and is producing much more thrombin with fiber. So it was initially treated with 7A and then was switched to fiber and you just count the number of bleeding events. And I can tell you that there is a relationship uh, between the number of bleeding episodes and the thrombin generation that is, the, that is shown here. But, and sometimes we have seen exactly the opposite. People having bleeds with fiber, switch to Novo 7 and uh, much less bleeds. So in conclusion, I do believe that individualization of therapy is likely to play a major role in the very near future for uh, cost utility or cost effectiveness reasons. The bleeding phenotype, lifestyle, PK parameters, and maybe surrogate markers and anesthesis will be different parts of the pictures uh, in order to adjust the prophylactic regimen. So there is no one single parameter. It will be a complex picture, but uh, maybe with the current uh, clotting factor concentrates and the future with the longer acting uh, concentrates, using all these pieces and information, we could probably, I really hope so, decrease the number of breakthrough bleeds improve the adherence in order to uh, be much more protected for the uh, joint uh, muscles and for uh, improving the uh, social life and quality of life of the people with hemophilia. Thank you very much for your attention.